Hey guys, welcome back. So let's start from where we left off. Now let's move on to the example queries for projects. Now here's the project entity and the partition key for the project is org hash org id. And for the sort key, we use the prefix pro hash for project and then the type of the project because if you can remember, we have queries to find a different type of projects as well, right? For that, we need this. And then finally, the project ID. Now, I want you to put your attention on the partition key selection for our entities. Now, let's go a couple of slides back. So for organization, projects, and employees, we have the same partition key, org, hash, org ID. Now, this is because, guys, without an organization, these entities will not exist. You can't have a project without an organization. Even the employees are belongs to an organization. So there is this hierarchy among the organization, projects and employees. Organization is the parent and the project and the project employees are its children. So all these queries run within an organization. So if you are doing a query against project or an employee, that is within an organization. So that's why we are using org organization ID as our partition key for project and employees. Otherwise, your query will send results that belongs to other organizations as well. Okay, let's go back. Now we were here. So in order to do the CRUD operation for an employee, the primary key and sort key selection can be as follows. So let's say the organization ID is 1234 and the project ID is 100. So in order to uniquely identify a project, we have to give an exact value for primary key and the sort key. So the primary key value is org1234 matching this pattern and the sort key value is pro hash then the type let's say this is a agile type project and then the project id 100. This will return a single item then you can perform CRUD operation on top of that. We still can't find a project by name and we still can't find the on whole projects. Let's take a couple other examples. Now look at this. Find Agile projects. So here we are expecting set of projects to be returned. So the primary key is org hash 1234. And then we are using again the begins with operator. Sort key begins with pro hash agile. So we are giving values only for the first part of this pattern. Pro hash, then the type is agile. We are not specifying the project ID. So thereby we use the begins with operator and it will return all the items that belongs to one, two, three, four organization. And the sort key begins with pro hash agile. Similarly, to identify all the fixed bit projects, we use begins with operator again with pro hash the type equals to fixed bit. I hope you understand. Okay, let's quickly move on to employees as well. So we can do the CRUD operation in the similar manner, but still we cannot find all the projects that an employee is part of. And also we cannot find the projects by name. So now let's move on to step number five in order to satisfy these other access patterns. So step number five, identifying the secondary indexes. Yes, we are going to use secondary indexes to identify those other access patterns. Now this access pattern is one of the not satisfied access pattern. So that is finding all projects and employee is part of. Now if you can remember I told you we have to use an inverted index to query the other part of the many-to-many -many relationship. You know one side of the many-to-many -many relationship can be done using the primary key but to query the other side of the many-to-many -many relationship we have to use an inverted index. Now there are two tables. This is one of our table entities project employees. So it is this one. So I isolated only that one here and there are the partition keys like this then org hash, then the org ID, because we always need to filter by the organization ID. And then we have another prefix, hash project or hash pro, then the project ID. So this is the partition key. And the sort key is the org hash org ID. And here is the employee EMP and the EMP ID. Now, if I want to get all the employees belongs to a project, so what I can easily do is I can send a query where its partition key is equal to org hash, then the org ID, let's say one, two, three, four, then hash pro hash, then the project ID, let's say 100. And I don't have to specify any sort keys, thereby it will return all the employee items 
that is related to this particular project. So with this primary key, we can query one part of the many-to-many -many relationship. Here, finding all the employees belongs to a project. But how about finding all the projects and employees part of? So in order to make that query, what we need is to switch this ID in the sort key to the partition key and the partition key value to the sort key. So we need to invert this. So for that, we are going to create a GSI or a global secondary index. We'll, we'll call it project employee index. And as the primary key for that GSI, we are using the sort key value of our table. So it is organization ID, then the EMP value, you see. And for the sort key, we are using the primary key. Now we can again easily query this GSI to find the projects and employees part of. Here's an example. Primary key is org hash 1234. Then let's say there's an employee with employee ID 300, hash EMP hash 300. We are not giving any sort key values, thereby it will return all the items that this employee is part of. Okay, now let's look at another example. Now this is about finding all organizations, projects, and employees by name. Now this is another access pattern that we couldn't satisfy so far. And I told you earlier, in our front end, we have a filter to filter projects, employees, and organization by its name. Now for that, we are going to use GSI overloading. Now when we define a GSI or a global secondary index on a table, we can use different attributes as the partition key and the sort keys of that GSI, which are different to the partition key and the sort key of the table. So now look at this example. Now here, as the partition key of our GSI, I'm, I'm using the partition key of the table itself. But for the sort key, I'm not going to use that SK attribute. Instead, I'm going to use another attribute called filter name. Now this is a different attribute. So when I'm inserting organization, employee, and project records or items into this table, I'm using this prefix for this attribute specifically. For example, say that I am adding an organization. So on my primary key is org slash then organization ID. And for this filter name, I use this prefix org hash, then the organization name. So if I am adding an employee record, then the partition key is org hash org ID. And for the filter name, I add M -E -M -P hash EMP name or employee name. Similarly, for projects, project has project name. So now we can issue queries on our GSI like this. Now if I want to find an organization by its name, so what I can say is I'm querying my GSI where its prime partition key is equal to org hash 1234. Here it matches here. Then the filter name attribute equals to org hash happy ink. Let's say the organization name is happy ink. So I don't necessarily have to use the organization ID here, instead the organization name. Similarly, if I want to find an employee by its name, then the partition key is org hash one, two, three, four. And then the filter name equal to EMP hash, let's say I'm searching for the employee called Manoj, then Manoj. So I don't have to use the employee ID here. Now we can satisfy this access pattern as well. Now guys, if you have a lot of text queries like this, you know, finding by name, age, and so many text queries, then there's a better approach. So here we are basically using an elastic search cluster. So what we'll do is we'll enable DynamoDB streams so that anytime we insert a record, delete or update a record, the DynamoDB will trigger a stream. And I will use a Lambda function to intercept that stream data identify the operation, whether it's create, delete, update, and then index that data item in Elasticsearch cluster or Elasticsearch service. Then if I want to do a lot of text searches, I will query the Elasticsearch service instead of my DynamoDB because Elasticsearch is made to do advanced text searches. It uses Lucene indexings to do lightning fast queries. So I will do all my CRUD operation like creating records, updating, and those things directly to the DynamoDB. But if I want to do filters queries, like text-based queries, I will use Elasticsearch directly.
Okay, let's move on. Now we have another access pattern that we couldn't satisfy yet. So that is about finding on whole projects. Now imagine that an organization has 100 projects. And out of that 100 projects, let's say three projects became on hold. It could be due to some budgetary restrictions or whatever. So how do we query for these on hold projects? Now one option is obviously we can define an LSI or local secondary indexes on this particular attribute called is on hold. So that's a one way. But here I want to introduce another way of doing that or a pattern that you see in DynamoDB. So that is called sparse indexing. So sparse indexing is nothing but another GSI or global secondary index. And we select is on hold attribute as its partition key. Now those three projects are on hold out of those hundred projects, right? So what we're going to do is we will update this is on hold attribute to true or any other value for that matter in those three on hold projects. So global secondary indexes behind the scene, it will maintain a separate table with the indexed items. Now, since we have updated is on hold attribute for only those three projects, only three items will be written to that index table. It's not going to write all other 97 attributes or items in that index table. So that is called sparse indexing. So GSIs are in general, they are sparse indexing. So what we can do next is we can then either use query or scan on this GSI. Now we can use either scan or query both because in that particular index table, it will contain all the records about on whole projects. It doesn't contain anything else. Okay, now we have gone through all our five steps. Now, if you have some experience in DynamoDB, you might have remembered there's another thing called filter condition. Now, filter conditions are used if you want to further filter results by non-key attributes. Now, the important thing to understand about filter expression is that this is applied after query finishes. Now, let's take the same example that we discussed in sparse indexing. Now, you are not defining any GSI on is on hold attribute. Instead, you are going to use a filter condition. So in the query, you say filter by on hold is true. So you add a filter expression is on hold equal true and expecting those three results. Of course, you will get those three items. But the thing is, before it does that final filtering, it will query all that 100 records in the table. So you have to pay for read capacity units to read all that 100 records. So that's why it says in the documentation, the query consumes the same amount of read capacity, regardless whether a filter expression is present. So we have to be careful when to use filter condition. So one of the common patterns is we do all the filtering based on our partition key and the sort key. And the result that is returned, we apply filter condition. So that is all right. And there's another use case for using filter condition. If the secondary indexes costs more than the filter condition, so that could be due to the low query velocity or the frequency, then you can again use the filter condition. Now here the reason is if you define a GSI, then you have to allocate capacity RCU and WCU for that GSI, right? And if that GSI is not frequently used, then you are spending money on that. So you have to check the velocity and the frequency of the queries against that GSI. If it is very low, then you can check the cost comparisons and maybe the filter condition will give you better cost implications. Okay, now this is the content that I wanted to cover. So in the next episode, Let's implement this example using DynamoDB Node.js SDK. Thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.